First, camp-wide, community-wide talk with the biological station for the summer term. Uh, I want to welcome all of you here. I see a whole bunch of people from outside the camp, which is fantastic. You know, we're a, we are a service organization, and the science we do, and the students we teach, and the research we do is aimed at making this place a better place to live. That means a better place for all of us in northern Michigan. And, and the science we transport to other places also, we hope, helps us learn how to steward the natural world everywhere. This is our home, and so we're so happy to see so many of you from outside the biological station here tonight. So you've got a Okay. okay, so we'll just, can I say we'll put a link on the UNBS website? Yeah, 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 okay. What here to do is graduate work in, in biology, what we now call the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Dave's first summer was 1982 here, despite the fact that he looks much younger than that. He was here in 1982 as a graduate student, and he has come back almost every year since. Maybe one missed as either a student, a researcher, a teacher. Um, he was one of the co-directors along with Steve Burton, who's in the audience, of, of an international, or I should say a nationally based PhD training program that we ran here for 11 years, but, um, that basically challenged PhD students from all over the country to come here and do both atmospheric climate work and biology. So those students that, that Dave and Steve and their mentors Trained here are now doing Dave is now a spring uh, instructor in ecology. The spring term is a one month mm -hmm. And he and his colleague, Steve Burton, could you just stand up so if you're here? Maybe he skipped that song. There he is. <laughs> they, they run. Please put your hand <laughs> You'll see plenty of Dave in a second. I won't keep this, I won't make this long. But they run a, a, a National Science Fund, Foundation funded program called Research Experience for Undergrads. And so uh, we have 10 undergraduate students here from uh, institutions around the country uh, joining forces with our graduate and undergraduate students who are here. So Dave has done and continues to do great work at the station. He's an ecologist, he studies the effect of elevated carbon dioxide not just on the climate, but also on the chemistry of plants and how plant chemistry changes in response to changes in composition of atmospheric gases and how that trickles through ecosystems to affect what eats plants and to affect what parasitizes what eats plants and to affect what eats what eats plants and so on and so forth. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Dave to the podium and he's going to tell us about the effects of climate change on the Great Lakes region. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you everybody for being here tonight. Um, what I'll try to do is go through a, a, a sampling of the ways in which climate is likely to change in the Great Lakes region. Depends very much on choices that we make between now and, and the end of the century, how much climate will change. We'll talk about different alternative futures that are available to us and then some of the biological consequences that would attend those different futures. And finally, what we can do to help make the future better than the one we're headed towards right now. And I'd like to mention that this is being recorded. Um, and at some point, we're not exactly sure how, this is all new to us, but we'll make a link available on the UMBS a homepage website. So if you want, it won't be immediately, but if you want to share this with others or use it in any way, um, you should have that opportunity. So the talk is clim effects of climate change on the Great Lakes region. And I'd like to try to address four questions tonight. First one is, is climate change happening? I think everybody in the room knows the answer to this, but we'll look at the evidence very briefly. We'll also address the cause of current climate change and specifically the evidence that it's human caused, not due to natural factors. And then we'll shift over to the bulk of the talk, which is about the impacts, largely adverse impacts, within the Great Lakes region. Throughout the talk, many slides will have it abbreviated as GLR, Great Lakes region. And then we want to ask how we can reduce those adverse impacts. Okay, first, let's just take a look at what has been happening 
on our planet. This is a video uh, put together by NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies that is simply a visual representation of what thermometers have been recording since 1880. And the way to read this, this image, which will change as time goes on, is that at any given point, it is showing us how the average temperature during a five-year period indicated in the upper right-hand corner, how the average temperature for each place on Earth compared to that same place's average temperature during the reference period, which is three decades, roughly the middle of last century. So for instance, the Western US in the five-year period that starts this record, 1880 to 84 inclusive, was cooler than the Western US was on average from 1950 to 1980. Okay, so we'll just look and see, has temperature been changing on our planet, the biggest component of climate? Okay, and the years are going by in the upper right. Okay, so unequivocally, yes, temperature has been increasing. Our planet has been warming. Um, it's actually quite, quite dramatic in this uh, visualization. And it's important to note right away that this is a categorically different kind of temperature change than we have any record of in at least 800,000 years of uh, ice cores out of Antarctica. And it's an, an, at least an order of magnitude faster. That automatically should suggest that there's a new variable involved. This is not due to the same things that caused, for instance, past climate cycles. If we look at that same data as a, a bar graph, which, where every bar is simply the, the world's average temperature for that year, what we see is that there was a period of moderate, uh, significant, statistically significant, but moderate warming from about 1900 to about 1940, followed by a period of not statistically significant change, a slight cooling trend, but not in scientific terms, a real trend. And then around 1975, we entered our current and ongoing much more rapid period of warming. Um, anecdotally, we have a, a lot of of ways to express the fact that Earth has been warming. The 18 warmest, 17 of the 18 warmest years in the entire record are in this millennium. The only one that isn't was 1998. That was a super El Nino year. And if we ask, well, those two, those two asterisks indicate 1998, and then again, 2015 was a super El Nino year. If we ask, when is the last year that Earth had a, a year that was at or below the 20th century average temperature, it's the last blue bar on this, which is 1976. So if you are 41 years old or less, students in the room, you have never experienced a year that was at or below the 20th century average, and unfortunately, almost certainly, you never will. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, maybe this is a good time to interject an apology to everybody who is young, younger than I am in this room. Um, my generation owes the younger generations an apology. We have started processes on the planet that are certainly not in your best interest. Um, some of us are trying to minimize or even reverse those, those patterns, um, but unfortunately a lot of that is gonna be up to you. Okay, 2014 was an interesting year, and it's worth talking about only because we're in the Midwest. 2014, at the time, was the warmest year on record. Then 2015 was, and then 16 was, and then 2017 was the second warmest. But it was the warmest year on record, but it was not, it's now the fourth warmest, but it was not anywhere close to the warmest year on record in our backyard. And that gives us a particular challenge when we talk to friends, neighbors, and so on about climate change, because we had a year 
not, re not too long ago, 2014, there was actually the 10th coldest in the entire thermometer record. But if you look, there's only one place on land that was cooler than average that year, and that and we happen to be in it. So bear in mind that that may be an obstacle that you have to overcome if you're trying to get people to understand the climate science. An important, our second question, an important question is how do we know that it's us? How do we know that it's not what is usually referred to as, quote, natural factors? Well, first thing I would say to anybody who claims that climate change is just a, this, is due to the same factors that caused all climate change in the past, I would say you are absolutely right up until about 1900. Prior to 1900, virtually all climate change uh, in the history of the planet was due to natural factors. And we know what those natural factors are. The one that caused those climate cycles, that was 800,000 years of temperature cycles out of the Antarctic ice core record. We know what caused those cycles, and it was changes in the amount of solar radiation striking our planet. When sun strikes surfaces, unless it's a pure mirror, that surface converts some sunlight into heat, and there are three cyclic changes in our position relative to the sun that alter how much solar energy is reaching our planet. The easiest one probably to understand is called orbital eccentricity. Sometimes our orbit is more eccentric, sometimes more oval, sometimes it's less oval. If it's more oval, then we spend more parts of the year far away from the sun and we're cooler. And we go from more to less back to more oval in about 100,000 years. Okay, not the sort of thing that causes any kind of appreciable change in solar radiation within a century. The other two are changes in the tilt of our axis. The tilt ranges from about 24 and a half to 21 and a half degrees. To go from 24 and a half to 21 back to 24 takes about 40,000 years. Also not something that changes climate on our planet in, within a century. And the third is called precession of the equinoxes. It's basically where we are in our orbit when the northern summer occurs. Because the land mass in the northern hemisphere is the surface, the part of Earth's surface that is best at converting sunlight into heat. If, if that northern summer occurs in a part of our orbit where we're close to the sun, then we tend to be warm. If the northern summer occurs where we're far from the sun, as illustrated here, we tend to be cool. That precession of the equinoxes, a cycle takes about 20,000 years. So we know that these are the things that caused past climate change. And we know that none of them can change in a, in a, at a rate that could even begin to account for current climate change. So, but we can ask, have we been getting more energy from the sun? When we have warmed in the past, that was the reason. We've had satellites in uh, in orbit that can measure very accurately the amount of solar radiation coming into our climate system. For the past 40 years, that's the time in that video when we entered our, uh, our current and ongoing much more rapid warming period. We've actually been getting less energy from the sun. Okay, here is the temperature change since about 1978. And the so, so, uh, the sun has an 11-year sunspot cycle, which does affect, affect solar radiation reaching our planet. But if you look through the 11-year cycle, what we see is that there's a statistically significant decline in solar energy reaching our planet while our planet has been warming the fastest. So there really is no reason to believe that natural factors have any role in current climate change. And if we look not back just to the satellite era, but back to the beginning of last century, and mixed in the other natural factor, which is volcanic activity, together changes in solar irradiance and volcanic activity would have caused Earth to cool very slightly over the time that it has been instead warming at an alarming rate. Okay, one other thing I think we should address, because this is a big point of misunderstanding, and it's the, that's, that's the result of an intentional effort to, uh, to confuse the American public, uh, the strength of the scientific consensus is as strong as you get on any issue in science. If we ask the experts, the climate scientists themselves, 97.5% of them say it's very clear that humans are the primary cause, if not the only cause, of current warming. If you want to know what is wrong with your heart, 
you go to a cardiologist. If you want to know what's wrong with your teeth, you go to a dentist. If you want to know what's wrong with the climate, or what's happening with the climate, you go to a climate scientist. And if you talk to the experts, there's, like I said, as strong a consensus as you ever get in science. So I think the best estimate is, to me, there's really no, no argument in my mind. The best estimate is 100% of current warming is due to us. About four-fifths of our influence is by burning fossil fuels, and about one-fifth is by cutting down forests, which used to be a carbon sponge, but now are a source of carbon as they decompose or burn. Carbon emissions are not equally distributed. They're not coming from all parts of the planet equally. If we look at where carbon emissions are happening, okay, this is uh, the year 2006. This is put together by National Center for Atmospheric Research. What's, oops, sorry. This one's a little tricky. Okay, what is this? This is summertime in here. Okay, th that's tropical forest burning. Okay, but look what happens in the winter. Okay, it is almost all coming from developed countries, of course. Okay. And that brings in something that I, won't, I don't have time to talk about today, but I think it's a really important part of the discussion about climate change, and that is that there's an underlying very strong ethical and social justice issue, and that is that the people who are causing the problem are not the same people who are suffering the adverse impacts. People in developed countries are causing the problem, but people in developing countries are going to suffer, already are, and will continue to suffer most of the adverse impacts. If we looked at the world, if countries were sized proportional to cumulative CO2 emissions from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution through 2002, this is what the countries would look like. Um, okay. China has passed us on an annual emissions basis, but the United States still today is the biggest cumulative emitter. That's Africa, okay? and most of it is South Africa. Okay. What do you think it would look like if countries were sized proportional to the adverse impacts of climate change. That's what it looks like. And the fact that those two don't look remotely like each other, I think absolutely, in my mind, indicates that there is an ethical obligation to do something. Okay, so back to climate change in the Great Lakes region. How has climate been changing in the Great Lakes region? Temperature's been increasing. We've warmed by about the global average, about one degree Celsius since 1900. There's more noise in a regional temperature record than in a global temperature record. It's just more variable year to year, the smaller an area you look at. But we see the same overall trend, uh, very statistically highly significant. But the trend hasn't been the same over the entire time period. Since 1975, the Great Lakes region has been warming four times faster than over the entire record. So climate change is accelerating in our region like it is globally. That was mostly land-based thermometers, but the Great Lakes have been warming as well. Every area here that has color is an area of a Great Lake that has seen statistically significant warming. Um, the higher rates of warming are, let's say, 0.3 degrees Celsius per year. That's, a, that's an incredible rate of warming. And if we look, there are parts of Superior, and actually there are, well, Little Traverse Bay actually will be a place where we've been losing ice very dramatically. But warming has been occurring throughout the Great Lakes, especially in Lake Superior. One of the consequences is that ice cover has been shrinking. So the Great Lakes actually have about 70, little more than 70% less ice are covered by ice 70% less of the year than they were in 1973. And among the areas that have seen the most rapid ice loss is um, Grand Traverse Bay. Okay, um, one of the things that we'll also talk about is precipitation, but I just want to interject at this point that when you don't have ice on the lake, then water can continue to evaporate. That probably will lead ultimately to lower lake levels. But in the meantime, it also leads to more opportunity for lake effect snow. 
Once the ice cover is on the lake, you can't have lake effect snow. There's no water to, there's no way for water to evaporate into the air. And we have been getting uh, a big increase in severe precipitation events, stream precipitation event. This is one about to hit Buffalo. It's a, a lake effect storm about to hit land. Precipitation is the other big component of climate and precipitation, we have about a 110 year record. In the Great Lakes region, we have seen an increase in annual precipitation. Precipitation averaged over the entire year. So I'll occasionally circle the Great Lakes region. Um, not really for you guys, just so I can find it on these maps. Uh, but we see blue in there and very little red. But a lot of that increase has been not in the gentle rains that are quite good for ecosystems, but in severe downpours, extreme precipitation events. In the last 60 years, most of the increase in precipitation has been in the form of these severe downpours, the kind that you, know, that you just can't go out in and that um, maybe make you pull the car off to the side of the road or seek shelter, and of course can cause flooding and so on. The national patterns have been that the biggest increase in severe precipitation events has been in the Northeast, but we've had a 37% increase in these events over the last 60 years in the, in the Great Lakes region. One of the consequences is we get more floods than we used to have. A lot of the Great Lakes region has been experiencing more extensive flooding. Um, this is Ann Arbor, actually Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, Lansing. We just had a horrendous event up in Houghton that it washed out roads. It was really quite amazing. Okay, so we've, been, we've seen changes in the two major components of climate, temperature and precipitation within the Great Lakes region. Let's look into the future and ask how, how will climate of the Great Lakes region change in the future? And the first thing, the most important thing I think is to talk about how we need to complete this sentence. Okay, the magnitude of future warming in the Great Lakes region depends on our choices. Okay, it is not set yet. We make choices every, almost every moment of every day that determine the uh, magnitude of warming in Great Lakes region. Two of the choices that, we, that are most obviously on the table right now, globally, not just for us, of course, are, um, sorry, I'm gonna back up a second. This, I'm sorry for the axes, I realize you can't read this. This is carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere. Um, this right about here is 300 parts per million. This is 400,000 years ago, and we're gonna look first at how carbon dioxide has changed in our atmosphere over the last 400,000 years. That's an important context in which to think about the choices that we have most easily available to us now. Okay, so here's 400,000 years of carbon dioxide fluctuations. And until 1950, atmospheric CO2 never was above 300 parts per million. 1950, it passed 300. We are currently 411 parts per million, okay. higher than probably in 50 million years. Okay, so what are the choices that we are considering at this point? The choice that we are choosing right now, it's the default choice. If you don't feel you're making a choice, this is the choice you're making. Um, is called business as usual, where we continue to very gradually replace fossil fuels with renewable energy. And we may double the amount of wind energy we generate over a five-year period, but we're doubling from a very, very small starting point. So we're really not shifting over very quickly. That's business as usual. That gets us to 950 parts per million by end of this century. I just want to point out for students in the room, I think of end of century as the rest of your life. Okay. This is not someone else's life. This is not, not, not an impersonal thing. To me, I look at my students and I think this is the rest of your life. Okay, and that would result in four, somewhere between four and five degrees Celsius temperature rise. The other choice we are considering is called the Paris Agreement. Not that would limit carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere to 550 parts per million. We get there by mid-century and then stabilize at that. And the corresponding temperature rise would be about two degrees C above pre-industrial. Okay. Both of them way different than anything Earth has experienced for quite some time. Let's say we do business as usual and ask, um, we, we should ask how much of a difference would a five degree 
change, Temp five degrees Celsius change produce? Would it, would it matter? Well, the last time our planet was five degrees cooler, that was North America. And this room and most of the Great Lakes region was under at least a mile of ice. This room was about three quarters of a mile of ice. So does a five degree matter to change matter to our planet? Absolutely, it's a very different planet. When was the last time we had five degree warmer? 55 million years ago. So we don't really know what Earth was like then, but we know it would be a massive change. Okay, let's look at our own backyard to start. What about temperature change within the Great Lakes region under business as usual, which will be abbreviated BAU in many of these slides. We're predicted to warm more than the global average. We're predicted to warm about 6.4 degrees. So that's business as usual future, averaged over the whole year for the Great Lakes region. Oops. But under the Paris Agreement, we'd warm about half of that, 3.3 roughly degrees. If we looked at either, each of those though is a, is a massive change. Okay, if we looked more broadly just outside of the Great Lakes region, just asked what would it mean for the US, it would prevent, a Paris Agreement would prevent a lot of warming throughout the United States. That's business as usual and that's the Paris Agreement. So if you come from a different city, I know our, our EU students aren't for the most part native to Michigan, you can think this would have, uh, this would have very beneficial consequences for wherever you are from as well, and anybody else who's here or who, who, who has relatives elsewhere. Okay, the warming would not be exactly the same during all seasons. We'll have greater warming in winter. Winter temperature is predicted to increase by about seven and a half degrees Celsius, which is about 13 degrees, I think, Fahrenheit. And winter precipitation is likely to increase by about 10%. And you might think, great, more snow. Um, turns out it's not all gonna be snow. Okay. Under the Paris Agreement, instead of warming seven and a half degrees in the winter, we'd warm about four degrees. Okay. And instead of getting 10% more precipitation, we get about 5% more. In under a business as usual future, much more of the precipitation in the winter, that 10% increase and quite a bit of what is now snow would turn to rain. So the historical pattern or ratio, let's say just in Michigan, the ratio of uh, rain to, or snow to rain, or the proportion of each is about 50-50 during the winter. Um, and that is predicted under business as usual by end of century to basically become almost entirely rain. So it would be zero to maybe 15% of it would be snow. Would we have snow in Michigan? Not very often. Okay. Um, the rain enters our aquatic ecosystems right away. And so things like for people who are in aquatics, aquatic ecology classes, limnology, wetlands, rivers, um, lakes, and streams. I'm not sure I have the title right. Um, the, especially if you're dealing with systems that are um, in flowing water, then the things like the, the, how big the greatest flow would be during the year and how early in the year it would occur will also change. The flows, peak flows will get bigger and earlier. Um, and rain in that time of year is generally not a great thing. The ground is often frozen and so water can't percolate into the ground. As a consequence, it stays on the surface and moves. So it causes flooding. It'll pool in a low place, cause flooding. It'll cause erosion while it's getting to a low place. So not really a great thing for ecosystems or human, human habit habitations either. And, at the same time, we're likely to see an increase, a continuing increase in extreme precipitation events. Under uh, business as usual, the average extreme precipitation event will get about 25% more extreme. So we'll have more of them and they'll be stronger. Um, under the Paris Agreement, that increase would almost go away. They would be about 5% stronger. We'd still probably have more extreme rain events, but they would not be as bad. What about summer temperature? In, under business as usual, summer, te summer temperatures go up 
again, more than the global average, six and a half degrees Celsius under business as usual. Here's a big problem though. I mean, summer is growing season, right? That's, that's a time when most life is doing most of its activity here. And along with a huge increase in temperature, we'd have a sizable in decrease in precipitation, 10% decrease, which would be very stressful for virtually all Great Lakes organisms. Under the Paris Agreement, the summer warming would be cut about in half, and the decrease in rainfall would be cut about in half. So less warming, less of a decrease in rainfall, much more likely that the species that we have here today will be able to continue to exist here. So it would be much less stressful for species and for ecosystems. Those were seasonal averages. But life forms tend to be more um, influenced by extreme events than by averages. So we could ask about temperature extremes. One of the uh, indices that we could use is the, the frequency of summers in the future that are hotter than what today is the current record hot summer in any given place on the planet, including the Great Lakes region. And it turns out that in the path we're choosing to go along, 70 to, to 100% of summers by end of century in the last 30 years of the century are likely to be hotter than the hottest that has yet occurred in the Great Lakes region. So if we look globally, we see an awful lot of red. Red is 90 to 100% of future summers are expected to be hotter than what's the current record hot summer. For those of you in agroecology, what will that mean for the kinds of crops that people can grow in, their, in their, the places where they've always lived? And in the Great Lakes region, under business as usual, it's, it's, it's not far behind that, 70 to 90, 70 to 100%, sorry, 70 to 90%. Um, under the Paris Agreement, the world would be much better off. Many fewer record hot summers, including in the Great Lakes region. It could be as little as 10% of future summers. And of course, lots of other places of the planet, especially the tropics and subtropics, would benefit tremendously in terms of avoided record hot summers. Another index we could use to talk about temperature extremes is not record hot summers, but just maybe very hot days. I don't know about you guys, for me, 95 is quite hot, uncomfortably hot. Historically, we've had two, on average, two throughout the Great Lakes region, except for the very southern part, two days per year over 95. The prediction, I, I don't have a prediction for Paris Agreement, but for, or I don't have a map indicating it, under business as usual, instead of two days per year, we're expected to have about 50 days per year over 95. Okay. Right. It, it would be a different place. Right? Doesn't have to, that doesn't have to be our future, but if it is, it will be a different place. Paris Agreement, instead of having 50 days per year, we'd have about 10 days per year. Okay, and of course, if you have 50 days per year over 95, you're going to have a number of them in sequence, in succession, and that's a heat wave, and heat waves have clear impacts for human health. I don't have time to talk about human health impacts tonight. Okay, how about species and ecosystems of the Great Lakes region? How are they, how is climate change likely to affect them? Let's start with aquatic ecosystems. Lakes are likely to be influenced primarily by two things. One is warming. And the other is the length of time during, in the summer during which the lake has, is, is stratified, which means it has layers. You can think of a top layer and a bottom layer, and the top layer cannot mix down into the bottom layer. So oxygen can enter the top layer, but it cannot get down to the deep layer. Okay, twice a year, a lake turns over, and oxygen gets mixed down into depth, and nutrients come up to the surface. Happens in the spring and the fall. That's happening earlier in the spring, later in the fall, the summer stratification period, the time between spring and fall turnovers is increasing. So we'll talk about that a little bit. In contrast, well, similarly, river ecosystems will be affected by warming, but also by changing flow regime. More high flows, maybe more low flow periods. Okay, let's look at warming for lakes and rivers. It's a, a bit of a fuzzy uh, image, but 
that's how it is in the original um, paper. Okay, and I think we can still see that under business as usual, there's quite dramatic warming, two and a half degrees maybe on average, warming of lakes and rivers. Remember, water warms and cools, changes temperature more slowly than land. So water will not be warming quite as fast as land. But that would probably be a challenge for a number of our aquatic species. Under the Paris Agreement, it's, it's substantially less, about a degree less, which would be much more, much more likely that our fish and our macroinvertebrates and so on could continue to exist here. It's actually, aquatic ecosystems are the easiest ones to predict winners and losers, climate winners and climate losers. If you like warm water, you're likely to be a climate winner. If you like cool or cold water, you're likely to be a climate loser. So in both lakes and rivers, warming will probably increase, almost certainly increase habitat, um, or cause habitat loss for cool and cold water species, but increase habitat availability for warm water species. And this may not be able to read it, but these are some of our lake and, and river fish arranged on um, basically a, a gradient of their optimum temperature. We have a few climate winners. We have a lot more climate losers listed here. Let me show you which ones are likely to be climate winners, some of them. Okay, in, they include carp, bluegill, catfish, perch. Those are not the fish that people go out on the lake to catch for the most part, and certainly not what our tourism industry is based on. Uh, unfortunately, those are well within the climate losers. So things like whitefish, all the trouts, walleye, all the salmons are cool and cold water fish likely to be adversely impacted. Um, that's just, that, that's a prediction just based on their temperature optima. But another big challenge for the deep water fish is this summer stratification period. How long the oxygen that gets mixed down in the spring has to last. And the predictions for change in summer stratification period are actually quite dramatic. Lake Superior is predicted to have that stratification last almost three months longer. So whatever gets mixed down in the spring, that has to last three months longer. And I don't think it will, quite honestly. Although the fish biologists here would have a better idea and limnologists would have a better idea. For Lake Ontario, it's about two and a half months. For Michigan, Huron, and Erie, it's about two months longer. I think that is quite likely to result in suffocation. Deep water fish will run out of oxygen, particularly if there is organic matter coming down that bacteria decompose because when they do that, they eat up the oxygen that's in the water, in the deep waters. And we could get routine, large-scale suffocation events, which we'd see as lots of fish washing up on shore, fish kills. Um, for rivers, remember, the big effect on rivers is likely to be altered flow regime. If we look at the number of high flow days predicted within for river basins within the Great Lakes region, they basically occur in winter and spring. Under business as usual, the prediction is an, about an 85% increase in the number of days with very high flow. That may dislodge caddis flies, I, I really don't know. Um, under the Paris Agreement, it's less of an increase, but still a pretty striking increase. The low flow days, which occur in the summer, are more of a problem. Right? That's when things are likely to die, either because the water is too warm or there isn't enough of it, or it can't hold enough oxygen. Under business as usual, we're predicted to see about a 50% increase in low flow periods during the summer, and Paris only about a 3% increase. And that, to me, is likely to be a huge benefit to aquatic ecosystems, especially flowing, ecosystem, flowing aquatic ecosystems. We're likely to have many more harmful algal blooms. Um, this is an algal bloom in Lake Erie that uh, shut down drinking water for Toledo. Up close and personal, Rex would say it's very pretty, I think. Would you say that, Rex? Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> so it is, it's a beautiful green, but many of the cyanobacteria, or some of them, secrete toxins into the water that make it lethal to fish, and of course we are told to stay out of the water. Why would climate change or warming lead to more harmful algal blooms? Because if we look at the optimum temperature or the temperature curves, 
growth at different temperatures, diatoms have, which are probably the, the best from an ecological point of view, the best of the algae and certainly the prettiest. Um, I think Rex would agree. Dinoflagellates, chlorophytes, they all have lower temperature optima than the harmful algal cyanobacteria. So we should, we'll almost certainly see a sh community shift towards the type of algae that we really don't want. And as those algal blooms die, that organic matter sinks into depth, the bacteria decompose it, pull oxygen out of the deep waters. Okay. So that's some, some about aquatic ecosystems. What about more terrestrial ecosystems? If we look at trees, under business as usual, 13 of our 20 most abundant trees in the Great Lakes region were, are predicted to decline by at least 50% just due to climate change. So paper birds, the aspens, balsam fir, um, cedar, uh, white pine, pretty much, I think our, I, white pine and sugar maple, I think of as our I, most iconic species. Under Paris Agreement, only nine decreased by that. And of the ones on here, the ones that no longer decrease that dramatically are sugar maple and white pine. So we keep them at, at higher abundances. The, as the trees change, of course, so do the forest types. And under business as usual, Great Lakes forests, Great Lakes region forests are predicted to, to change pretty dramatically, less dramatically, but still change under the Paris Agreement. This is our the Forest Service's uh, map of current forest types in Michigan. We actually have six forest types recognized by the Forest Service in Michigan, which are the white red jack pine, home to the Kirtland's warbler, spruce fir, more northern, southern part of the boreal forest, oak hickory, elmash cottonwood, maple beech birch, and aspen and birch. Under business as usual, we lose three of those. Okay. And oak hickory, Michigan be basically becomes oak hickory and elmash cottonwood is the prediction. Under Paris Agreement, we retain two additional ones. So we still have some white red jack pine, we can still have Kirtland's warblers, and we do still have some aspen and birch in the upper peninsula. Forests are, of course, more than just trees. So we can talk about, for instance, bird species. There are 24 bird species in Michigan that are predicted to decline by somewhere between 80 and 100%, including some I think are familiar to many people in this room. So this is a call, I've been hearing it recently. Old Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. I think it's simple but elegant. I like the way it throws the sparrow. Okay, I don't think I can pause these. Oh yeah, I can. No, that's just started it over. Okay, so now I don't see a pause button on any of these on this. <laughs> <laughs> on my computer I do, but okay, so sometimes white-throated sparrow and viri sing together and that's what's happening now. <laughs> okay, so the viri, it's a beautiful thrush call in my opinion. I mean, these are sounds that, that if we continue to choose the future that we're choosing right now, passively, but choosing, we aren't going to be able to hear in Michigan, where our children and grandchildren won't be able to hear. Okay, what about Paris Agreement? Instead of 24, only 10 decrease that much. And among the, those that do not decrease by 80% or more are all the ones that are disappearing off the slide. Okay. Loon is still a casualty, unfortunately. We know that for mammals in the Great Lakes region, Phil Myers has done quite a bit of work. Um, Joe, I don't know if Phil is here. Okay, yeah, Phil's here. Um, Joe, Joe's a bump, and Phil are co-teaching mammals this year, and Phil published a fantastic paper about 10 years ago now that showed unequivocally that southern small mammals are moving up, and they're actually replacing the more northern species. For instance, the white-footed mouse on the left is 
correct me in private if I'm wrong, Phil, um, <laughs> is clearly replacing the, the deer mouse. Um, and white-footed mouse, anybody know? I don't have time to mention it because we're not talking about human health. What's that a reservoir for? For Lyme disease. Okay, so Lyme disease, of course, is likely to increase with climate change. I don't, we don't have predictions that replacement will continue, of course, but we don't have predictions under different uh, business as usual in Paris agreement. Forest, uh, fires, not just in forest, but particularly in forest, are likely to increase fairly dramatically, actually throughout the whole US, most dramatically in the West, but also in the Great Lakes region. And so everything that lives in a forest will have to deal with greater fire frequency probably greater fire intensity. We have two REU students who are looking at, uh, Maria and Modeline, who are looking at the effect of fire frequency on, we hope, the white-footed mouse, if there are enough around this year. Yep. And Fatima, another REU student, is working on changing stream, the effect of changing stream flow uh, regimes on crayfish. So, our EU program, if you are a student and are interested in doing climate change research, think about applying to the RU program next year. We have three more years of funding. Okay, in, in the Great Lakes region, for instance, the fire season, the time during which we are prone to fires is likely to increase by at least 20 days. And droughts are something, I mean, they're, they're really the, the most frightening face of climate change. Droughts kill more than any other kind of extreme event, and I don't have a business as usual versus Paris comparison. This is under a scenario that's about halfway between them. These uh, colors here from minus eight to minus two, sorry, to minus one, those are our officially recognized categories of drought. This, this color is exceptional drought. And the kind that takes out agriculture, period. So if we look at that again. And the years are going by up at the top quite fast. What we see is that the Great Lakes region is predicted to have a massive increase in droughts. Um, that is not factored in to any of the biological predictions that we've shown. But certainly, again, for the agroecology class, that's going to be a huge challenge for agriculture in the region. If we take a step back and ask, what, are, what is the likelihood of massive ecological change on our planet and in our region? What we really are asking about is biome change. And it turns out that under business as usual, 70% of our land surface is at, likely to be at risk of at least moderate biome change. We have 11 major ecosystems on our planet. Each one is a different biome. So a change from one biome to another is quite a big thing. A moderate change would be something like the boreal forest north of us getting invaded and replaced by Michigan's forest, a deciduous, temperate deciduous forest. A major change would be something like the Amazon becoming a savanna, the Amazon rainforest becoming a savanna. What is the predicted uh, risk probability of moderate to major biome change here as moderate as blue, major as red, and somewhere in between as green. Under business as usual, virtually all of the Great Lakes region is predicted to be at risk of, of at least moderate biome change. Under business as usual, will Michigan feel like Michigan by the end of the century? Almost certainly not. Okay. And it's even more true for other parts of the world. So if we look at the Great Lakes region, it's virtually all blue, green, or red. What about Paris Agreement? Much less of the Great Lakes region, and it turns out not 70%, but about 25% of Earth's land surface will be at risk of at least moderate biome change. That's a planet that still feels like Earth. Okay. And a Great Lakes region that still feels like a Great Lakes region. Okay, very important message that I hope has come up enough times already that you maybe almost are sick of hearing it, is that the future depends on our choices. And it is up to us. Okay. In Paris, in December of 2015, 195 countries said, yep, we will do what it takes to limit warming to two degrees, and if possible, 
to one and a half degrees. Okay, there have been some setbacks, but uh, it's still an achievable goal. How do we do it? Well, the first thing we have to recognize is that we are getting our energy from the absolute worst source, and that's fossil fuels. Okay, that's oil, natural gas, and coal. Nuclear provides some in the form of electricity, and all the rest are our renewables. Okay. This is the worst. This is for U U.S. energy use. This is the worst because coal kills more than these. But what we really need to do is ramp up wind and solar and maybe geothermal. Um, in the meantime, until we do, something we can start doing today, this moment, is choose to use less fossil fuel derived energy. If you turn off, Steve did this as the back of the envelope calculation, if you turn off a 40 watt bulb for one hour, you've left the room, you're gonna come back, you actually turn the light switch off. Steve, can you remind me how many carbon dioxide molecules that prevents from going into the atmosphere? Something times 10 to the Okay, so, okay, so the, my recollection is it was, it was something like one times 10 to the 20th. And a massive amount of carbon dioxide molecules that you prevent from getting into the atmosphere simply by turning off a light switch. So we can practice energy efficiency and conservation. By the way, when a carbon dioxide molecule gets in the atmosphere, it stays there for about a century. It's a greenhouse gas the whole time. So. These are little things, but they're important things to do. Energy efficiency and conservation. Most important thing you can do around your house is insulate it, weather strip it, and of course insulate. Second most important thing you could do in your personal life is next time you buy a car, get one that gets a lot better mileage. I think I have one of those actually, a, a Volt, a Chevy Volt. I get 55 miles on a battery charge, twice to Sheboygan and back, once to Petoskey and back. Um, off, off of zero gasoline. So, and then it has a gas tank that it can switch over to if necessary. If one thing we can do is change our diets, we can opt for a more low carbon diet. The dining hall this year has done a great job replacing beef, which is the, almost the worst part of a carnivore diet, lamb is worse, um, with chicken and other things. So fantastic. We can turn our thermostat the direction we don't want to turn it up in the summer, down in the winter, and of course change all of our electrical use to much more efficient um, units. But the problem with all of that, th those are incredibly important things to do, but w that is not enough because that will not change the future. It will just delay the future. If we're still getting 86% of our energy from fossil fuels, then maybe every prediction for 2100 just becomes a prediction for 2110 or 15 or 20. What do we need to do? We need to start generating energy in different ways. We can generate some of our own green energy, put panels on solar panels on your rooftop, or you could even buy. Most utilities now allow you to pay a little bit extra, not much, to buy, help them produce more green electricity, wind and solar. I think that's an essential step. I think it's going to be grassroots. It's going to be bottom up. If you are a member of a faith community, there's a great organization called Michigan Interfaith Power and Light, where a, a number of different houses of worship have said, we recognize we have a stewardship responsibility and client, minimizing, mitigating climate change is a very important way for us to meet that obligation. I think it's more important to, number one, tell our current policymakers that we want them to make smarter choices, particularly with reference to energy. We need to get about 80% of our energy from what I think of as smarter sources by 2040 if we're gonna meet the two degree target. We have solar and wind, we've had them for 50 years, and using today's technology, any of three solar technologies, um, we can produce globally 100 times all of the energy that humans use if we used today's wind turbines technology, we could produce 40 times all of the energy, not just electricity, all of the energy that humans use. If we wanted to produce all of the US electricity by solar alone, we, would set, we could set aside an area about that size, 100 miles on the side, and it would produce, it, again, with any of the three major solar technologies, all of the electricity we need, and here's a, 
a piece of misinformation that is very widely uh, circulated, which is that we can never depend on wind and solar because they're intermittent. Wind doesn't always blow, sun doesn't always shine. Two of the three solar technologies produce massive quantities of heat by focusing light uh, on, a, on a surface. And then that heat is used to make steam, to drive a turbine, to generate electricity. You can produce so much heat during the day that you can store it even relatively inefficiently in a heat reservoir underground, even on the surface, and use that heat, tap it all night long to make steam. If you make steam, you can make electricity. And that is being done 24-7, 365 in the Mojave Desert, in Morocco. It is, it's a pernicious, I would say, lie that we can't rely on this. Um, we certainly can. Really important thing is to talk. To people. This has become an issue, it's been made into an issue that is very, very difficult to speak to others about in many cases because it's very partisan. It should not be. No science should be partisan. So we need to do a better job of talking about the causes, consequences, and solutions. We can talk with friends, which is going to be easy. Okay, They usually feel pretty much the way you do. You can talk with co-workers at the office, for instance, but, you know, and, and it does not have to be a lengthy conversation. I'm a big fan of what I call guerrilla climate change discussions, which is basically you just plop it down on the table and you get out of there. So, you know, I'm at, I'm at the bank. This is a true story. I'm at the bank, I'm signing a check, and it's February and it's 70 degrees. And the teller says, don't you just love that weather out there? And I say, yes, uh, I mean, it's really nice, but, you know, this is actually a bad side of climate change. What if the cherry trees put out their flowers, and if frost comes, we'll have zero cherries this year, and all the farmers will starve. And then I sign my check. <laughs> OK, I exaggerated a little. So and then I sign my check, and I just, I'm out of there. And you put it on people's radar so that they hear it, and they start to think about it. Too, too many of us are just ignoring it. So yeah, try guerrilla tactics. We need to talk to people who think differently than we do. Um, it's everybody has the same stuff at stake. And so we need to talk to everybody about it. And we especially need to talk students, you need to talk to peers, people older than students, we need to talk to young people because we will never meet the two degree target if students don't get on board and if the faith community doesn't get on board. Those are two voices that I'm convinced are absolutely essential and they're just really quiet. Now, we need students, we need young people who's, who have the most at stake. We need you guys to get much more vocal. Okay, you can get involved in climate change research. That whole lot of climate change research is going on at UMBS. So we have projects asking, for instance, how much are carbon, how much carbon are forests sequestering? That's our Ameriflux tower. And to some extent, our facet set up as well. We have people, including myself, who have worked on questions like Newt mentioned about how Rising CO2 affects plants and things that feed on plants. This is Leslie Decker, used my chambers for several years. We have questions about forest disturbance. We have REU students working in the facet experiment as well. The kind of forest disturbance that climate change can cause. Put in another plug for our climate change program here, which is called Climate Change in the Great Lakes Region. It's the, it, was, it is co-funded by the National Science Foundation. And Newt, you know the other? Department of Defense? Yeah, Department of Defense. Department of Defense is funding it because it's climate change research, because climate change is an immense national security threat. Okay. First time I've ever been funded by DOD. Um, I think we can speak, but we have to be very careful about this. I think we can speak from the moral high ground. There is absolutely an ethical issue here, and it is not fair to do what we're doing, what the developing world is doing to the, sorry, the developed world is doing to the developing world, and quite honestly, what our generation is doing to you. Okay, I think of our generation, some of us are trying very hard not to let this happen, but our generation, talking to the students in the room, our generation is stealing your future, and that is absolutely wrong. But we need you to help not let us do it. Okay? We need you to get involved. You have so much at stake. Okay, you can uh, choose to join or just support what I think of as a climate truth organization. Citizens Climate Lobby, fantastic. They have a single goal, get a revenue neutral carbon fee and dividend. 
Um, one of the things, if people are interested, one of the things CCL does is asks people to write a constituent comment form that they then bring to your representative. And it basically says, I'm concerned about climate change. I want you to do something. We have 20 of those forms up here. Anybody can sign it. If you give it to me, I'll get it to the CCL person who will bring it to your representative. This is one for students. This is what I hope will save the, well, save the future. And that is the Sunrise Movement. It's a national organization, student-based, um, headquartered in Lansing, or at least one of their headquarters in Lansing. If you're a student and you want to get involved, Sunrise Movement is definitely something you should look at. This has the links to both of those on here. And ultimately, we've got to get people in decision-making positions who will make decisions that don't steal your future, that, that don't uh, compromise the planet. So we need to make it a major voting issue. And I do have one sticker on my vault. It's kind of guerrilla tactics because it's in my back window. People pull up behind me at a stoplight, they read it, and then I'm off, they're off. I'm just putting it on their radar, and it says simply climate voter. And if they think, what's a climate voter, and why would he be a climate voter, that's good. Get them thinking about it. OK, here's what we have. Here are the choices that we have. On the left is the Paris Agreement. Years are going by here. These are the worlds that can be ours or yours in the future. And business as usual is on the right. Okay, so those are two of the choices we have. And they're very, very different, obviously. <coughs> What's the bottom line? For our part of the world, just like the rest of the planet, it would be great. We would benefit tremendously from limiting warming to two degrees. That's true for humans as much as for ecosystems and species. For a little while, not very long, for about a decade, it's, gonna be, it's still going to be on the table, still an achievable target. And it, I believe it's immensely worth fighting for. So if we want to change from this future to that sort of future, where Earth still feels like Earth and the Great Lakes still feels like the Great Lakes region, we have to first and foremost switch from that sort of energy supply to others that we already have available. And again, very, very important to recognize that it's up to us how the future turns out. For the students in the audience, you are in the enviable you're in the unfortunate but in some ways enviable position of being a generation that can save the planet. And not many generations can save that. Maybe none can say that. But you can be the generation that saves the world. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>